We're on part two of the mission to find out where your content marketing isn't firing on this episode of Confident Content. Now we're in the middle of your customer journey and how it fits into your marketing. And so in this episode, we're going to focus on the connected stage. This is the first step after someone's discovered you. We're going to cover that stage in the next session. We're working backwards. Our content needs to be good enough for them to see that we're worth a follow, that we're worth hanging around to see again. And I call this coming onto our sticky content web and not letting them want to ever leave us again, which is a really effective way. By the way, I wrote about this in my book, Be a Spider, Build a Web. This was traditionally the part that I would have taught you to put all your how-to content, but there's been a shift in the last 12 months and the old how-to content that we used to love is not really building as much trust the way that it used to. So in this episode, we're going to walk through how much of this sort of content, the connected content we need to be making, what type of content to make, what content types to avoid, and why you might need to create your own red, green, and beige flag chart of your ideal client before jumping onto it. We're halfway through our content marketing audit, which I like to call a look-see because audit freaks me out with this episode. So listen in, take notes, and go take some action afterwards because content marketing is all about getting results, right? I am your host, Rachel Claver, and this is Confident Content. It's all designed for you to become more confident in your content. So as this is a new podcast, I'm laying down the foundations of how I would work with you if you're working with me on a strategy and help you take more notice of the content that you're doing. Open your eyes to where the gaps are and help you really become more confident first in the results that we can get from our marketing. So I'm really excited to be sharing this with you and I think we should just jump in and get started. Okay, so in the introduction, I talked a bit about why we might need to create your own red, green, and beige flag charts. Now, beige is a TikTok thing. Beige flags are those things that are a little bit disconcerting and maybe a bit weird, but not bad or not good. And so what I would like you to do before you even start thinking about this is we really need to think about that ideal client. And often when we're creating how-to content or content that gets people engaged, we're accidentally attracting people that aren't our ideal client. So what I recommend you do is grab a piece of paper, put three columns in and call one red flags, one green flags and one beige flags. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write down under red flags all the kind of behaviors or types or things that you don't find are great for your clients. So for example, for me, I love helping people develop confidence. It's one of the things that I'm really good at. It's one of the things that I really love. I've got a client who has identified that that is something she doesn't like having. So I would have that in a green flag. She would have that in a red flag. Another good example would be, I don't like having to have people where I've got to manage their time or do lots of admin things. So that would be a red flag for me. And I've got clients who absolutely love that part of working with a client and managing that sort of stuff and micromanaging and keeping in contact with all those little admin things. So that would be a green flag for them. A beige flag could be more about personality things. So I quite like working with people who are neurodiverse because I am neurodiverse. I also like working with women, although I don't just work with women. Half, all my coaching clients are women, never set out to be that way. Uh, but all my marketing strategy clients, it's a 50-50 split. And so I might have my beige flag might be people who are quite comfortable in women-led spaces. Um, beige flags would be that... They really like talking about um, Australian thrillers or things, uh, some personality stuff about me, okay? It could also just be the beige flag stuff. could be that they, uh, you know, they've maybe given video a go or things like that. It's not a red or a green. It doesn't matter if they don't do it or they do, but that would be a beige for me. Whereas for someone like Harrison, who's um, someone I love working with, he's a video expert. He wouldn't have that in beige. He'd probably have that in green. So everyone's is going to be a little bit different. But I want you to create a bit of a plan around this because what we don't want to do is accidentally create content that's going to attract the wrong sort of person. So if I talk a lot about admin and hacks around, you know, like managing things for you and how I can do these things for you, then that's a bad idea because I'm going to get the wrong sort of clients. If I talk about how my clients need to be self-reliant and they have to put in the work themselves and they have to be ready and have capacity and they have to be able to do these things and be prepared to change and make changes, 
that's going to attract my green flag clients and not attract my red flag clients. Can you can see where it's coming? So this is really important because we need this at this connected stage more than any other stage because we want to make sure that the content that we've got is either going to actively help someone choose to follow us or actively repel them. They go, uh-uh. Now, they might be a red flag person, but they might want to be a green flag person. So some of those people are still going to join us. We don't sit there and go, oh, cool. I'm just going to check through and see what you're like to make sure you're, you're worth following me. But it does help us create these ideas. So red, green, and beige. Create a little ideal flag chart of your ideal clients. You've got some really good ideas around what they're going to look for. So you would do that. Then what we need to do is think about what sort of content we're going to create here. So back in the day, this used to be called the how-to concept section. And we talk about how you could do three ways, three things that you can do to make your Instagram profile shine or um, three things that you need to bring to a, a photo shoot session. Now, there is a place for some of those things. But because of the rise of ChatGPT, because there is so much content just flooding us of that generic type of content, it can get lost. The more we do that content, the easier it is for us to be sucked in by just looking like the rest of our competitors. And I'm not interested in doing that with you. We're a little business, a little boat in a very big ocean. And I don't want you to just be standing there looking like everybody else is. Sure, you might have your branding colors in there and stuff like that. But I don't want people to be going, man, I think I've read this four or five times on other people's accounts. I want it to be content that people go, damn, that person's interesting. I want to work with that person. And so that's what the sort of thing we're focusing on around your how-to content. So we don't want to be thinking about having generic advice. We don't want it because especially the rise of ChatGPT, like I literally could do how-to content till the cows come home just by using ChatGPT. Give me three things to do about such and such. I'm so disappointed about the results you give me. I Often one thing I will do if I'm getting ideas is say I want five, I'll ask ChatGPT for 15 and then I can kind of pick through and get some ideas. But I will tell you my ideas often are better than theirs. Um, the other thing is, is that with ChatGPT, if you're going to use it, you have to really think about how you're going to slide it in the way that you would design it or create it. So for example, I could ask ChatGPT for some advice or some ideas or tips, but then I've got to go, is this in the language that I talk? How would I use it talking about the sticky spiders web that I use? How would I use it talking about being a goat in a tree or all the other things that I do and sliding it in there? The more we use ChatGPT without that filtering system, the more we just get this homogenized loop of content that feels like we've done it and it feels good, but it doesn't personally connect with people who are going to want to connect with us. So you might get likes on it, but you're not going to get those follows. You're not going to get people drawing closer to you, which is the whole point of this connected stage. So that's what we're doing, all right? So we want to make sure we're not going to use lots of directed advice, and we also want to make sure when it comes to how-to content we're not accidentally sharing all of our deep, darkest, and best secrets. You are allowed to gatekeep your content. There is content that I share generously with my paying clients that you won't hear even on this podcast. I share more with you on this podcast than I do in my content, by the way, on my social book content, because I feel like this is a more intimate thing. Plus, half the time I forget. I forget I'm, you know, that I'm doing this and that you can listen to this for free. So half the time I forget and I just chat away. But I have levels. I have my social content. I have, um, that's my narrowest, like that's my more genericist stuff. If it's, if it's going to be all shallowest, then my email content is deeper. Podcast is deeper. And then I have the client work that I do and they get the best stuff. You sometimes will see glimpses of it and that's how how-to content works as you see glimpses of some of the best stuff. But we should never be giving away our best secrets on our content. And that means that we have to be good enough at what we do that the stuff that we do share is good, relevant and interesting enough but still not our best stuff. That is the challenge. So I want to make sure that you don't replace yourself with your content. Don't share all the good stuff. So, so if we're not, if we're saying, well, if we're not going to do how-to content and like explaining things, and we're not, that's shallow, and we're not going to do stuff that replaces us and shares all our secrets. What stuff do we do? So, one of the things that I talk about when I go through this idea with how-to content is that I want you to think about your how-to content, and we're still going to use the phrase how-to, how-to content in three versions of types. 
One would be, what sort of stuff would you need to know before we work together? The second one is, how are you go- how are you going to work with me or how people are experiencing working with me or what you would do while you're working with me? And the last one would be, how to contents that's suitable for people who've already worked with you? So there's assumptions that they already know things, so there's like a barrier to people going, wow, how'd that work or how'd that thing work? We don't want the simple stuff. The simple beginner stuff is okay if your target market is complete beginners. But if we're using just complete beginner work all the time, we are going to attract people that are going to take a very, very long time to convert to us if we're not working in the beginner space. So we have to be aware of that. The other thing that I want you to be deeply aware with content across the board is to shift changed behavior. We can't go from someone who's anti to someone who's pro. That's not our job. Our job is just to shift someone a little bit further from where they're sitting and our job is to do that on a gradual basis. So if you've got something that has a philosophical argument around it or a big idea that they have to believe in to then purchase your services or your products, we don't want to talk to people who don't have that belief. We want to talk to people who either already have that philosophical agreement or idea or are close to adopting that. We don't want to be talking to people who don't even have it. That's an educational process that isn't part of what we do. And the mistake we often make is we spend so much time arguing our case in this kind of content. We have so much time arguing our case of why people should do a particular thing with us. We don't need to argue why. We are attracting the wrong sort of people when we do that. We just need to do what we do and show them that it works. And the right people will be attracted to that. The way I talk about it is that People who don't understand the value of what we're doing, they aren't the ones that are close to making a decision with us. And I call them the broken win clients. They are people where you are, for some reason, feeling this validation to justify how you are working or why you're doing your stuff or why you're worth the value. And it's such a waste of energy. Just ignore those people. Don't even talk to them. We don't have to justify our prices. We don't have to justify our model. I don't have to justify why you can only book with me for one-on-one content on a Monday or a Wednesday and why there is booked out times and you have to choose this time because otherwise it's going to be another 12 weeks. I don't have to justify that because that is just what it is. I don't have to change my times for you. I don't have to justify the fact that I'll charge more money if you want to see me in person than if on Zoom unless you're coming to my office. I don't have to justify anything and neither do you. We don't have to shift people. If you've got an intent-driven business or a purpose-driven business, we don't have to justify the way we operate, our belief systems, our value systems. People will either love it and follow and connect with us, or they won't. But if we do stuff where we're trying to justify those things and trying to prove that stuff and worth, all we're going to do is attract people who troll it or aren't ready to be close to working with us and it's the wrong audience. Let someone else do that work for them. There'll be someone that comes before you, before they work with you. There'll be someone that comes after you when they've worked with you. You sit where you sit. And I think that's really important in terms of what you're doing. It's the same with like if you've got a luxury items and you're selling luxury items, you don't have to justify the price. Don't even get into those conversations. You don't need to. The minute they say that it is too expensive, not your ideal client. Your budget is not their budget. Their budget is not your budget. We don't talk about it. Money, vision, intent, purpose, uh, mission, all those things, we state it, but we don't have to justify it. And it's really important. We are not a political argument for our business. And that's really key. So that's part of that. What sort of, so so keeping that in there, let's break down those three areas of how we would do this, Okay. So one of the things is, is instead of thinking about teaching skills, we need to talk to needs. So there are lots of different mindset needs that people want. So most people want to make more money. They want to um, spend this money, save money. They might want to be more confident. They might want to look better. They might want to um, be more be more comfortable, be more healthy. Whatever that primal need or that need that you're speaking to, that is what we speak to as opposed to here's a quick hack that we can do. Now hacks are fun and we're actually going to use them a little bit in the next section which is our reach but when it comes to the connected information, the stuff that people would follow you for, 
people don't seem to, tend to follow for a bunch of hacks unless it's what you've built your profile on and if you have it's probably difficult for you to convert those to customers to be honest so we're not just going to focus on those hacks what we're going to do is focus on how we interpret the, the skills that people might need to have to meet the needs of our ideal customer those green flags that we know that that person has I've identified that they need to have this thing so I'm going to talk to that need that's what we're focusing on so when we look at how to content and we break it down let's take that first first session so the first session is what do we need to know before we work together so if I look at those green um, green flags one of mine is that they need to have capacity so in terms of how to content I could potentially do a post around how to create capacity for your marketing so I'm not saying how to, to realize you need to have capacity. I'm teaching that. Now, there's nothing in there that's actually not generic towards something else. I'm not teaching a secret marketing skill. I'm just teaching how to add that capacity in. I could do into that one how I outsource, and I share this quite often, how I outsource or prepare to outsource to a virtual assistant because that's part of this capacity driven. One might be on how to become um, more comfortable on camera because I'm not saying you should be on camera because we just have to be on it I'm saying how to become more confident so I have all these things that I know are stepping stones that will make it easy once they work with me and I have a list of those topics and that becomes my how-to content there it's not how-to content that is generic it's stuff that I've hard learned it's in my voice so it's the way that I talk so when people see it and they react to it they go I like the way she thinks the way she explains it I feel like I'm connecting with her this is the whole point of this connection one right and this sort of content all this how-to content is around 20% of our content so if we go back to the um, the three posts a week and you know from last week if you listen to it I'm terrible at this mess thing it means it's probably once every second week if it's three posts a week or if it's five posts a week if it's one post a week would be this type of content okay so it's not heaps but it is important because it's going to get that trust it's building a trust in you building authority and who you are and people knowing what you do so we're going to have that so we have that need idea so we're going to have things like um, understanding that you're at, when we're doing that before you need to work together focus on your ideal client and not a broken version of your client so for example, I know that I um, I would don't want to talk to people who just want everything done for them, who wants to outsource everything. They're not my ideal client. They are ideal clients for other people, but they're not mine. So I'm not going to try and argue why you should outsource and why you shouldn't outsource. I'm just going to talk to people who know that they have to be involved in their marketing, not trying to change an opinion. I'm just doing that because that's going to attract my ideal clients. For someone else who does outsource solutions, they don't want those people. They want other people. But we might have a similar thing, which is like too busy. If someone keeps on saying to me, I'm too busy, I don't have capacity, there's going to be a problem because I'm going to have to meet with them. I want them to commit to times with me. There's all these different things. And that would be similar for someone who's outsourced. So that would be a red flag. Um, if someone I've worked with people like that they've worked with me they don't do the work I get deeply frustrated I'm like what a waste of money spending time with me you didn't get the results and it wasn't my fault it was because but then it was my fault because I didn't check that first so I've become really 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 strong on making this part of my content so that I'm attracting the right people for me who aren't using the too busy flag with me which is the red one okay so that's part of this I mean, look, we're all busy. I'm busy. It's when you tell me you're too busy as a way of justifying why you're not doing it. We just make better choices at that time. That's me. I'm a bit rough on this. Okay, so that's the first one is what you need to know before you work together. Think about all the different little objections and things that people might need understanding with or some skills or some advice or some support around things that they might need. Not heaps before they work with you, but just kind of those things of, smoothing the edges and that's your how-to content for that stage the next stage is the when you're working with me stage and so it could be things like for how you work with me I, you can put that in there it sounds quite salesy but it can be like here's how I work with a client on this particular thing or here's how um, here's how I would suggest this to a client I often use it I've used it in podcasts quite often where I talk about what I would do um, and one of the things I'm really excited about this podcast is very soon there's going to be some podcasts 
that are me doing live coaching with some of my clients and you'll see how I work and hopefully you'll like it. Um, and if you don't, not I'm not your ideal person, right? Because they like it the way I do it. And so that's a really important part of that. So we want to make sure that we have got how people experience working with me. So talking about your personality and the way that you work with people. You can also share a little bit of glimpses of the content that you share with your paying clients. So I might share like a graphic or a flow chart or a part of the process. Um, I might share a, um, a way of telling a story or, or show a type of story that I would teach my clients and then say that it's something that I would have done. I might do tips to increase your um, improvement on stories. In terms of that, what we need before we work together, I run a free content marketing course around New Zealand and sometimes online and people often go, oh, well, you're teaching a lot in there, but I'm teaching the bare basics in there that then when people know that and understand it and it opens their eyes to it, I then when they come into the coaching program, I can take them further and so for me, I'm all about getting people warmed up for the big event. And then in that how-to section for the big event is kind of giving them an insight to how, what that process would be. How would that work? Um, how does it work? How does a coaching session with me work? Um, how, do you, how would it run if, if we were doing a one-on-one -on -one session together? Um, what is some content that we would do in here? What is something we do when we're talking about SEO? What is something we're doing when we're talking about storytelling? What is something we're doing when we're talking about caption writing? And so I'm quite happy to share those, but I would share the beginning parts of it and then glimpses of the of the more intense stuff as we're doing that process. So what you need to know before you work together is a how-to session. Section. What do you need to do if you're working with me or how I work and how that looks like and how it looks like with a client? That is also part of this how-to content. And then the last one is content that that is content that is feeding your community of people that have already worked with you where they can come in and go I love this I love doing this using the language that you would use with your customers a lot but sharing frameworks and ideas and thoughts that your customers that have worked with you in the past love and appreciate now for me as a marketer that might be going through a framework and explaining a storytelling framework and then going through in depth and it might be a more complicated one or it might be talking about the email sequences that you might need with a bit of information around it. If you were a stylist, it might be like an update on particular colors or things. But there's holes, of course, because we need to know all the other stuff behind it. You could be a retailer and it might be sharing an insight on how to use one of your pans or something like that. You could have um, some advice or stuff for people that you've worked with in the past around and reference work that you've done. So like people who have attended this webinar, learned this skill, here's a little snippet of it giving people insight to the process. So it's what you need to know before you work together, the stuff that you would do while you're working with me, some insight around that, and then the work that would be done if people were working, assumptions that people already know some basic stuff to get that, that people are attracted to and go, how do you do that? In this space too is how I get results or how um, my business is going is all part of this building authority area as well. And a lot of the change in here has been that we used to use a lot of um, you, how do you do this? And now it's, I learned this thing. I want to show you this thing that I developed. I want to, and it starts with I. We're starting a lot more of this how-to content with I, where it's more reflective, or my client, where it's more sharing their idea, then you need to do this thing, which sounds quite bossy. People turn off. They're wanting to feel that in-person, per, in interrelational way of hearing the journey to help them work through it. So those are the three types, main stages or three types of how-to content. If you are wanting a very long tail, a very long-term building a web, then by all means go for beginner stuff, but be aware that those people could be in your list for six to 10 years before they're ready to make contact with you because they've got to go through other processes and they might often also be the most needy, they're often the most engaging and they often are the people where you put that time into them, but you're missing with the really important ones. So just be wary of that. So you need to be thinking about that. The three stages of customers that you need to be thinking about are those, you know, before you work together, how you work, the people that are working with you already or are about to choose to work with you, and then people who already have worked with you or your current customers. And that's a really important part of kind of working through all of that area there. Um, one of the other things that I want to talk about this is that 
it is again just really important that we think about talking to those needs. So for example, um, I might teach a storytelling technique, but I talk about why you need to learn it. So it might be if you're tired of not getting results from your content marketing, perhaps it could be that you're not your content is good, but you're not connecting with your audience and helping them understand things. So here's a simple storytelling technique that you could use. That would be a good example of how-to content. If I turn that into an I thing, I could say something like, my whole business changed when I started using storytelling more in terms of connecting with my customers. I want to share with you three things that I always make sure are important when I'm running a story that's going to connect. I need to have a hero of the journey. I need to have a problem that they're going to face. I need to have an awareness that they're going to overcome that. And then I go, and the sneaky last one is the result. I actually got four because I didn't think about it before I started talking about it on this podcast. Okay, so this is the content. We do this for 20% of our content. I've gone through that. And we, I want to check with you. I want you to have a look. Is your how-to content too basic? Is it too generic? Is it something that doesn't reflect actually who you are and your voice? Is this something that you could work on? This is key for getting people to really feel like they're bonding with your business and what you do. And then, of course, the next stage is building, building bonding with you as a person, which is the one we covered last week. Is that content there? Is it the right type of content? And are you maybe doing too much of it? You really only need to be doing that 20%. So once every two weeks, if you're doing three posts a week, or once a week if you're doing five posts a week. Obviously, if you're doing more, you have to work out the maths. I'm not going to do it for you. Okay, I hope that helped. I'm really enjoying going through this with you. Next week, we are doing audit part three, and we're talking all about how to get people to notice you and building your audience once you've got these parts right. So we're going to take into that. And then after we do that, you're going to be hearing uh, from my first coaching session, hopefully, um, working with someone on their coaching, one of my clients, and developing their content marketing, and you can learn alongside with them. Until next week, I hope you have a great week. Teach, um, let me know how your content's going. Remember, come and be part of the content uh, Map It Marketing uh, group on Facebook if you want to ask questions. I'm loving all the emails with feedback. Thank you. Please rate and review this if you found it useful. Please share it with someone if you found it useful. And if you'd like to let me know how it's going, um, send me a message through creative, uh, creative, conf oh my gosh, Rachel, you're still not doing it right, confidentcontentpodcast.com. You can send me a message in there or even leave me a voice message that I can listen to and perhaps even play on the show. Have a great week and I'll talk to you next week.